Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Leaders Credit Union. Thank you very much, Zach, and welcome everybody to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Zach, before I introduce today's very special guest, what's something you discovered this week at Discovery Park? Uh, I was recently doing some social posts in the military gallery, and I discovered a boonie hat that we have on display. Many soldiers wore it during the Vietnam War because it was so hot in the jungle. Why do you suppose they called it a boonie hat? I would love to look that up. I think you should. I I think that would be an interesting social post. For people who don't know what you do when you're not co-hosting Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast, what is your regular job here at Discovery Park? I am the manager of marketing and PR at Discovery Park. I wear several hats with that, uh, but the main thing I do, most important to me, is the social media side of things. Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, uh, Instagram. Speaking of TikTok, we just hit 100K views in a video. I know. I saw that. That was really impressive. Um, I'm anxious to see. How long have you been working at Discovery Park? It'll be a year on July 5th. Oh, my goodness. I did not realize how fast a year has gone. It really has. So our guest today is Ted Franklin Ballou. I'm so excited to have him. Uh, There's so many things Ted is doing and has done. I don't even know where to start. He is a Western Writers of America Spur Award winner. He has been a consultant on movies like The Last of the Mohicans. Uh, He's a snappy dresser, and he's the author of Finding Daniel Boone, His Last Days in Missouri, and the Strange Fate of His Remains, a great book. I just recently took it with me on vacation, and it was a a fantastic read. Uh, Ted, when you're at a dinner party and people want to pick your brain, where do they even start with you? What what is your favorite thing to talk about? Well, that's a good question. Um, Boy, where to begin on that one? If the direction goes in terms of writing – and, and a lot of times it does. Oftentimes, uh, what I'm asked, and 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 writing it sometimes morphs into history, and probably the same way with you and Crockett. You know, you have a background in journalism, and you write about you know the other American frontier hero, and uh, so oftentimes um, I am asked about how do I acquire this interest in in Boone. And uh, so maybe we can a- approach that path initially. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, tell us a little bit about your book and uh, share with our listeners uh, what you, maybe what you learned about Daniel Boone after researching for the book that you didn't already know. As I researched Boone, and I've been kind of on Boone's trail off and on since I was a little boy, and um, probably in the, uh, the, the early to mid-'80s, I began hearing more and more of these stories about the controversy concerning Daniel Boone, that he, um, as as to give a little backstory, Daniel Boone did die in 1820. And then supposedly, as the story goes, his remains were removed uh, from Missouri near where he died and taken to Frankfort, Kentucky, and there interred with the great ceremony. And uh, then about a score of years later, there was a sort of a, a controversy that began to brew that, in fact, the uh, Kentuckians that came in a delegation in 1845 to retrieve the Boone's remains, and that's Daniel and Rebecca. We oftentimes tend to leave her out, but she's certainly part of that story, um, that they got the wrong remains. And, and then this began to take shape and form and gain feet, and then it becomes a a fully developed story. Well, I really wasn't aware of this until the early to mid 1980s. And then in uh, about that time, about 1990 or so, uh, a National Geographic issue came out and and they talked about it as well. And there was a forensic anthropologist, uh, Dr. David Wolf up in Frankfurt, uh, who got one of this plaster cast of skulls of uh, Daniel Boone. As you know, uh, that it was a, a raging science in the 19th century 
to conduct phrenological studies, people would, there was this kind of a fake science about you could look at people's skulls and you could feel the depressions and little bumps in their head and you could determine uh, how wise they are or what their faults were. And so when Boone passed in 1820 and then when he was reinterred in 1845, there were two or three different uh, phrenologists that made plaster casts of his skulls. And I might add, they made casts of the plaster cast and then cast upon cast upon cast. And it became kind of a thriving cottage industry. And they were actually sending these skulls out for examination and some were lost. And, and there's, I've located three. And anyway, this uh, anthropologist who actually is a real scientist, uh, not a phrenologist, examined the skull and he said, well, uh, there were certain features that might lend itself to the story that this might not be the actual skull of a Caucasian, that this might be the skull of an African-American. Now, he didn't, he didn't say that it was, he didn't even give a percentage, but he just said, you know, this, the, what he had to work with was um, very spare. Most of the skull had been deteriorated. It had been smoothed over with sandpaper to look nice. And so, Anyway, people took that and ran with it. And so every time I would give a talk on Daniel Boone, typically I would get about three great myths. And one is that he, did he explore the Rocky Mountains? Um, is one of his children sired by a brother? And where is he buried? And after a while, I just kind of got tired. Of, it's like throw away my talk and just talk about basically where is he buried? Because that's what people wanted to talk about. And so I, actually went up and interviewed Dr. David Wolf uh, in December of 1990, uh, 1991 and spent a full, a, a full day with him up in the forensic lab in Frankfurt and there's bodies piled around and uh, for some reason he had a an interest in Charles Manson at the time. So we were watching Charles Manson videos and there's bodies piled up and we're looking at different skulls at the features. So it was quite an a, quite a interesting day like that I've never had before or since. And so I tried, I began unraveling the story in the mid, uh, about 2006, something like that. And, uh, and then I grappled as you, I'm sure when you wrote your crockett book, like, how do you approach this? I tried different ways. And finally, I adopted the tack of um, writing this as a um, first person narrative. And I don't know if you or your listeners are familiar with the uh, the writing style of Tony Horowitz, but I really admired Tony Horowitz's book, like on the Confederates, uh, Confederacy and other travel books. And so that kind of lent itself to going back and forth in time with what I had to do. And so that's basically uh, how I approached it. And then the book came out in October 2020, um, right in the middle of COVID and kind of uh, tanked about that time. <laughs> so, um, but that's that's the most recent Boone book. Well, it's a great book and and a really enjoyable read. And we've also got all your other books um, on our bookshelves here for sale at Discovery Park. And you were gracious enough to autograph those. So uh, next time anyone's up here at Discovery Park, they can grab a book. Um, I got to say, you know, uh, in addition to being a writer and a consultant and all the stuff I said, you're also you're a fashion icon from from where I stand. But maybe for the wrong era, though. I mean, not not. Um not a present day uh, fashion icon, maybe 200 years ago. If I was a highway man or a, or a mixed blood or a, a really scroungy frontier guy or a pirate, yeah, I'm, I'm there. Uh, otherwise, not so much now. Well, and, and in addition to all that, you're also an educator, correct? You, you're a professor at Murray State? Uh, yes, sir. I, I was uh, I hired on there um in the fall of 1991 and um i got the job accidentally they actually called me in the summer that summer and and uh the department of history was having a uh, some kind of a get together and somebody told them i was a really good bartender and so they asked me if i would uh if i could come over and bartend i said i don't know anything about it i don't drink and then i said no no and then they thought i was trying to drive my price up they said no we'll pay you even more i said I don't know how to do it. I don't, that's not my thing. And so they got me confused with somebody, I guess. But, <laughs> I, 
I, I, I said I can open a beer, you know, and hand it to them. Or so I'm, I'm happy to do that for money. I, I was broke. And so, uh, but I had been writing for different magazines and encyclopedias, and they picked up on that. And they said, by the way, would you want a, a part-time job as an adjunct teaching World Civ? And I said, yeah, I needed some money. And uh, I said, sure. Uh, I did had I had taught one class at Eddyville Penitentiary in maximum security. So that kind of maybe helped uh they couldn't get away. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, that was like exactly. It's like a real authentic captive audience, you know, <laughs> where you actually do call them by numbers and uh, literally, they were literally so, the captive. Yeah, so the, the irony is, I said, uh, but I've got to go. I was, um, I had just been hired for a seven week stint to uh, work on the film set in Asheville, North Carolina, of the Last of the Mohicans, and so I said, well, when I get back. Assuming I survived the French and Indian War, maybe it'd be the last, the, the next to the last of the Mohicans, I'll come back and teach. So I came back and I got a job teaching uh, World Civ. And then as that job sort of transpired and they learned a little bit more about me and some of my publications, then um, they took me on full time and made me permanent. And uh, then I developed an entire curriculum of American Frontier, a courses on Americans' roots, roots music. I'm quite interested in that. And um, the courses concerning uh, American Indians and uh, global history of piracy, things like that. And uh, but I taught a lot of world civilization as well, which really tied in to that material. And so I, I, I consider the Murray State experience to be uh, quite positive, And I'm very grateful that, that they hired me on. And but right in there, I was right. I was writing more and more for magazines like Muzzleloader Magazine, I'm on their staff, uh, True West Magazine, some Wild West, and it's uh, it's easy to get those confused. But my typical day would be uh, go to bed at 10 or 11 at night, uh, get up at one or two in the morning, work till about 6.30 writing, and then go teach, and then come home and do that again. And I did that for a number of years. And, and uh, the other two books that you didn't mention, I had the, the Buffalo book came out in 96, and then I had a smaller book on Daniel Boone, <clears throat> excuse me, a transcription of a memoir by Peter Houston uh, that came out in 97. And then in 98, there's about a 600 page book that I transcribed on Daniel Boone. That's like the magnet, magnum opus on Daniel Boone by Lyman Draper. And then uh, the uh, Hunters of Kentucky came out, I think, in 2002 or three. And then the uh, the last book, Where Boone is Buried, I don't remember, uh, 2020, I think. And so, but uh, 150 or so magazine articles in between, lots of History Channel stuff. So, and then you're teaching full time. So, uh, it was a good weight loss program, uh, <laughs> if nothing else. So. so, back us all the way up to the beginning. I'm curious, uh, what influences... Uh, you experienced as a youngster that uh, put you on the path here to be able to do uh, so many interesting things related to history that you're doing? I would say, number one, it was my father. Uh, my father, uh, Frank Ballou, who died when I was in 10th grade in high school, but at least for the 15 or 16 years that I had him, really fulfilled my world as what a real father should be. It was hunting, fishing, it was going out of the woods and looking at animal tracks. It was learning how to shoot shotguns. Um, it was throwing axes. If, if nothing else, it was just walking out of the woods and identifying birds, identifying tracks. Um, so that, at least in terms of uh, the frontier stuff, I guess it would be that. Plus, he, he was a mailman and had a high school education, but he loved writing. He loved Jack London, for example. And uh, he wrote for magazines such as the Florida Naturalist. It's kind of a spinoff of the Audubon Society magazines. And uh, he wrote newspaper articles on hunting and fishing. Uh, he was an avid snook fisherman. If anybody knows what a snook is and sharks. And uh, so I was just always there, part of the adventure. And, and when he would write, uh, and he would write on like Florida hurricanes, he would drag me to the a library with them uh, with the understanding that back in those days you did not make a sound in the library and so I you know I had to just kind of sit there and entertain myself with books and so I, I would say that my, my father's influence is is overarching both in terms of um, history 
the love of reading, love of outdoors, and then in terms of music, I mean, he was just eat up with Bill Monroe, Hank Williams, Patsy Cline, the Dolmore Brothers, but he also liked Benny Goodman and and good swing and just basically anything good musically and and, uh, and so he played mandolin passably he he wasn't accomplished at it he wasn't ready to say for nickel creek or something <laughs> uh, but but he played mandolin and he played guitar and he would write out by the time i was in second or third grade a uh, little chord charts and uh so i would play behind him uh, uh he would play mandolin and um, so that, and then we, he played Bill Monroe records and say like, hey, this is what you need to do right here. And then right in there, I, by second or third grade, I got a five string banjo and was pretty much staying home from school as much as I could, faking sickness to stay home and try to figure out Earl Scruggs. So my, you know, Earl Scruggs, Bill Monroe, and um, Daniel Boone sort of defined my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I know that's a little bit odd, but that really is. I, I would lay it at my, in my father's camp. And then when it was time to leave home and go to college, uh, you've got so many interests. What what was your major? Well, college is a different kind of thing. By Really, uh, I don't know how many boys have this experience, but by about uh, seventh or eighth grade, all my fascination with Daniel Boone pretty much evaporated, and I was looking at the uh, uh, girls. And so um, r- right in there, I began running track and so forth. And so a lot of the Boone stuff just kind of went away. And my father died in 10th grade. He was a World War II veteran. And um, and he was also a, a mailman. Uh, so I had transferred to me the GI Bill and civil service benefits. And uh, I regret to say, but it's just how my life went. When I got into college, uh, I was not a serious student. By this time, music had pretty well taken over my world. And I quit in the second year, sophomore year, and played uh, bluegrass music for several years with uh, local bands, uh, which I really appreciate their experience. They weren't well known, so there wasn't any you know famous group. But we played the same package shows as Bill Monroe, Lester Flatt, the Osborne brothers, Jim and Jesse, Ralph Stanley, uh, Keith Whitley, who a lot of folks would know, and Ricky Skaggs were playing with Ralph then, Ralph Stanley. And uh, of course, they weren't famous. They were a lot better than I was. <laughs> but uh, but I was a banjo player. And so I basically, I was just uh, a stump up on stage. You know, bluegrass musicians don't really smile and cut up so much. But that was my world for several years. And then I got married. And... Uh, and I, I think a lot of men can relate to that. All of a sudden, uh, it was time to quit living on uh, Hamburger Helper and uh, get a, a good day job. And so my wife encouraged me to go back to college. And I was a wildlife biology major because I really have a fascination on, on natural history, particularly snakes. And uh, But because of my really sordid academic background in grade school, I could not pass anything related to math, particularly chemistry. So history I could do, and, and right about the same time, I began being around men that shot, I moved to Kentucky, and you were around people that shot flintlocks and uh, black powder guns. And when I moved to Kentucky, my entire, it was kind of like Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. You know, you, you had this moment where like the lids come off your eyes and all of a sudden you just are zoomed back to your past and it becomes Daniel Boone, uppercase emboldened, capital letters. And, uh, but now it's got a more serious bent. And uh, so that's, but right about the same time, uh, Murray State, I, I got a, a master's degree in history and a bachelor's in history and uh murray state took me in and kind of g- gave me a little niche and uh i'm a ver- i'm a very very blessed man and uh oftentimes i just scratch my head and go how did this happen so it's uh i, I really do appreciate the lord in my life and a-, a great woman in my life and i've had a lot of opportunities and uh I- I'm-, I'm grateful for every bit of that tell me again where actually were you from originally where did you grow up Yes, sir. I'm actually I'm from the from the hills of Orlando, Florida. Okay. Wow. Okay. That uh, was a big. That was a big move. Yeah. Uh, home, home of dismal world. And uh, <laughs> are we allowed to say that? 
You can say anything you want. This is your podcast episode. I'm a, I'm a Florida boy, and uh, it's just not, I think, being with, again with my father in the library. I, I discovered, unlike a lot of people, I didn't discover Daniel Boone on television. I, I didn't. I, I did later watch the Fess Parker series, and, and I was a little bit, uh, I, I was born a little bit out of sync for the Davy Crockett period with Fess Parker. I'm a little bit after that, and uh but I really appreciate all that. But but the, the library is where I really that that just opened up to me. I learned to read very early on, and uh, so I was just fascinated by Boone. But but a lot of other you know mountain men, anything related to history um, was an interest. We're going to take a quick break, and when you get back, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the reenactments that you do, and and some of the other ways that you uh, celebrate. Uh, history. With nine branches in West Tennessee and nationwide ATM and branch access, you can take Leaders Credit Union with you wherever you go. From checking accounts, credit cards, home loans, and their state-of-the-art mobile app, Banking with Leaders can help you move forward. Learn more and see how you can qualify for membership at leaderscu.com. Now, we've talked a lot about writing, and I know that you've written in a lot of publications. There's like a West Western magazine. I, I can't remember the exact name of it, but uh, there's an article I read, What History Has Taught Me, that, that was a profile of you. It was really good. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Sure. Let me let me just kind of uh, go back just a bit and, and mention that the article that you mentioned, uh, it's, a, it's a profile of uh, what history has taught me that was actually in, in true west magazine and uh, it's easy to get those confused i've done it plenty of times and uh, it was the the editor editor stuart rosebrook that um was kind enough to offer that moment to me so i i, I really appreciate that in in terms of um my writing too and I, i'm i haven't forgot what you said let me let me just make a point and that is you mentioned the scholarship side, but you also mentioned the trade press side, and that 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 that's not accidental. It was always part of my plan early on. It was my wife basically that says you ought to write. You you have an ability to write, but I I really wanted to have a foot in both camps. You particularly, and, and you know this. You've got a great book out there on Crockett. You want to have a certain level of historical credibility. You want the important people that are in that understand that topic uh, to accept that, but you also want to open it up to the everyday kind of person. And so I have one side of me that's really uh, quite interested in scholarship, but the other side that's really influenced by particularly Ernest Hemingway, uh, Edward Abbey, uh, the great Peter Matheson, writers like that. And so that's really key to what I do in terms of trying to write. In terms of the the living history or the reenacting or whatever, yeah, there is a side where it certainly it is fun to go out and and look the look and and have the arms and the accoutrements that they had. But for me, that was uh, really not the attraction. The attraction is if you're writing about the era, there's a certain verity and veracity and truth that you have. And you don't even have to say anything about it. It's it's the uh, it's it's kind of like Hemingway and the iceberg theory. You see what you see at the top, but it's the underneath that buttresses everything. And that is when you know how to shoot a flintlock, and you know what it's like being out there in a lean-to for three days waiting to eat something because you've gone out there with nothing and you, you're going to try to live off the land, we might say. Uh, if you know how to throw tomahawks, you know how to skin deer, how to tan hides with uh, animal brains. Um, when I would teach Murray State, I would, as best I could, incorporate experiential history, I think it's called, into my classroom. Uh, I would uh, take in smoked buffalo tongues. And um, I would take them outside and show them how to make a, a survival shelter, a debris hut. Uh, I, we would go out and throw atlatls. Uh, I would teach them just the basic rudiments of making fires. When you have a sense of how to do that, that really casts your writing into a whole different perspective. It, it's like the movie The Last of the Mohicans. When you're out there fully armed and accoutred and dressed, as close as you can be in 1991, 1992, as the men were in 1757, and you have more than a thousand American Indians 
that are painted and armed appropriately. When you go back and write about that, that's in your bone marrow. That's in every word that you write. And it just really influences what you do. So I would encourage, it's the same way, I'm sure when you're writing your Crockett book, you probably travel to some of these sites. You know, when you go to the Alamo, you're going, I own this. You know, because you, there's something about that. You really have a connection. And so the living history not only uh, provides a certain dimension in terms of um, fun, but it but it also really influences your work. And it's a great way to, to educate people. You know, the, the saying that one slogan uh, that, excuse me, that, that one picture is worth a thousand words or whatever. Certainly that that does fit that as well. But. But you also pick up a certain amount of income. You can get, uh, like I, I mentioned, I worked for several weeks as an extra at last the Mohicans. I didn't do that for money, but then I, I filled in at, at the History Channel and so forth. Um, and so all of this, just at least for me, providentially, all worked together to do what I do. Uh, so, I'm, I'm again, I'm very grateful for that. And I don't, sorry to ramble. Feel free to cut me off, Scott. Hey, I wouldn't do that. I'm I'm thinking of a thousand things I want to ask you and trying to figure out which of those I want to ask. So I know when you research and write about someone and and you know with the reenactment that you do, you really connect with a historical character. I'm curious, does that continue on for you even after the book project is over with? Do you still feel uh, a connection with Daniel Boone? You you really do. And, uh, you know, and I've had that connection with Boone ever since I was a boy. And, and to this day, I can't really understand it. But yes, you do. Absolutely. And um, it's the same way I've been privileged to know the people that help operate the Daniel Boone home in Missouri. And uh, they've been kind enough to oftentimes just sort of give me the run of the place. Uh, I don't do anything that's... Uh, you know, illegal or anything like that, but but they they let me just kind of wander around and, and go where I want to go out to the past the perimeter to the creeks and to the streams and and look at the landscape and uh, you really do try to muse a little bit about how did this look two hundred years ago? Um, how did this fit into Boone's larger story? And I don't know how you are when you read another writer writing about David Crockett, but you know. <laughs> There's a certain part of me, another Boone writer, you're going like, well, did he get this right? You know, where did he get, you know? And so, um, but when you go to the, for me, the monument where Daniel and Rebecca Boone are buried, and they are buried there, or they were interred there in, in Frankfort, uh, Kentucky, um, in a, 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 1845, uh, there was a part there that you do absolutely feel connected that this is a, a a larger story that i help tell and uh it, it's kind of like my my really big daniel boone book uh, the life of daniel boone it was a transcription of lyman draper's uh magnum opus on boone it took years to do it's uh, out of print sadly but you can you can download it i think you would be quite interested in that actually and uh, I, I see that as legacy and, and my gift to Kentucky. So if there's anything that I've gotten um, out of this, if nothing else, it's basically trying to give back to, to, to Boone's story, to the history of Kentucky, to the great stories of, of America. And I'm just a little cog in all this. And, and I really do. Uh, I, I'm humbled again by that opportunity. But, yeah, I, I feel a connection. I mean, don't you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then the first two biographies I did were people who weren't famous. And so there wasn't that much written about them um, by biographers. And, and, you know, you go to their homes that they grew up in. You go to where they're buried. You you sort of follow in their footsteps. And absolutely, you feel a kinship with them. Uh, I do still to this day. The thing is, too, you know, you, you've got those books on the shelf. And, and those books will now have their own life. And without, you know, trying to dredge up a bad memory here, but but after we're gone, they'll still be there. And and they will mean something 
to a certain cadre of people and uh, and they will expand upon that and you know whether these people are greatly known or not so well known um the bottom line is you did your job and you contributed to that story and so that's uh, it's like a discovery park that that's an interesting thing that's trying to promote that and keep that going and um so you know thank you for your contribution there as well well, thank you for that. And, you know, what was interesting to me about the David Crockett book is, like Daniel Boone, people have written about him over and over and over again through the years, and I would find incorrect information, things that I knew were incorrect that had been repeated, and I would eventually find where that information had first begun, where it had started. And that would give me the opportunity to correct it and get the right information out there. So let's let's take care of a little business for for Discovery Park while I've got you here. Um, obviously, we have a David Crockett statue and a um, we have an exhibit here, and we do the powwow and we do David Crockett birthday celebration. You know, we'd love to see some of those things grow and get bigger and add more uh, ways for people to learn and experience and be inspired by history. Uh, what are your What are your thoughts about that? Do you think there's a need for something like that? Yeah, I, I think that. Um First of all, and this is not, I don't, I don't at all mean this uh, patronizingly. I, I, we, we've been to uh, Discovery Park a time or two, my wife and I, back several years ago, more when it was getting built and, and, and getting completed. And I uh, thought it was really a, a, a fabulous facility on its own, but also one that had a lot of potential. And so, yeah, I, I think... It, it, and, and, and given the point as a slight disclaimer that you can't, as, as you know, you know better than I, you can't do things overnight. You can't say, okay, well, we're going to do it. It's going to be a big blowout this year, but it might be a big, might be a, a bigger blowout this year, but it might be a really huge blowout, say like in three or four years. I, I think that um, there is a place certainly for representation of uh, perhaps some kind of a timeline, like a, a living history timeline of where you could represent certain time periods like where you are um you would have had early french influence certainly you would have a number of french voyageurs and courier de bois going up and down uh, the the father of waters the mississippi and you're not you know too far from that right uh, certainly you have spanish influence and uh then you get into periods like the uh the, the early british and whether it's French and Indian War or Rev War, I'm not sure. Rev War, that's, that's pretty far west. But but then you get into uh, War of 1812, and certainly that's, uh, you know, the Creek Wars and all that. That's, but I do, I, I think that there's a place there for, for living history, maybe a, an annual rendezvous, you know, some kind of something, uh, perhaps uh, the occasional black powder shoot. But I don't know if you're able to do that there. I mean, that that involves... Um, other logistics. I don't know anything about the facility. Well, I, I do know that we shoot uh, cannonballs. Um, I don't know if we're actually shooting real cannonballs, but I do hear the boom out there when, when, when they're shooting. And, and we also have, you know, some folks that are shooting uh, guns, but I'm sure they're shooting blanks. We, we do have a lot of reenactors who, who come here and uh, take advantage of our guests and, and do the reenacting and educating and living historians is what we call them. And I would just love to see those opportunities grow and, and see more and more come here at, to Discovery Park uh, to do their thing. You know, we, we have the forge, we have the grist mill, we have the cabins. I feel like the bones are there, um, and we already have a lot of excitement happening around it. And so I'm just excited to see that grow and to see more people come take advantage of it. What about, um, I mean, I had thought about it would be a great place for something like a, uh, a Roots Music concert. I mean, man, you have got the facility. And if uh, push comes to shove and there's a threat of rain, you probably have some place inside where you could rush folks too. But, um, you know, you're, you're two hours and a bit from Nashville and, uh, and, you know, you may not be able to re- afford the Ricky Skaggs and the, the Marty Stewart's, although you might could, uh, but there are certainly people that are um, perhaps not as well known that could come. I, I, I put on eight, uh, Roots Music Concerts at Murray State, my wife and I. And um, 
I had Chris Scruggs, who's now playing bass for uh, for Marty Stewart. And uh, Chris came out, uh, Ranger Doug Green, um, Riders of the Sky, and uh, Celtic bands and so forth. So I was thinking maybe like a, a blues and bluegrass concert, uh, something like that. Uh, the, the reenacting possibilities, I think, are, are omnipresent. You're in a great location. The problem is, and this has got nothing to do with any of us, except a lot of that, at least with the groups that I'm familiar with, is sort of uh, going the way of attrition because, it, I mean, it really is a kind of a, a late boomer phenomenon demographically. And uh, it kind of has some high moments, like with the Civil War uh, centennial um, in, I guess, 1965. And then with Jeremiah Johnson, and uh, like 19, 1972, you really saw a lot of the whole the frontier thing really kick in. And then with, with the release of Michael Mann's Last of the Mohicans. And so that was really a, a big groundswell of that. And now with um, certain social and cultural issues, you're seeing some of that kind of evaporate enthusiasm wise. But you're also seeing just that demographic uh, passing away by way of attrition. I'm like the last of the boomers. Yeah, I've, I've thought of that. Um, you know, back when I worked for Elvis Presley Enterprises, we found that uh, there were new Elvis fans being born every day, and they replaced those uh, people who had been interest who who had passed away or whatever. And so um, I am curious to see what happens with celebrations and, and events that are related to history. You know, I'm, I'm wondering if there will be a lot of people like me coming along behind us who are also going to be just as interested. That's what I'm hopeful for. Of course, I keep my eyes on the demographics of the events we have here, and I do see a lot of young folks uh, coming and, and with little kids, and, you know, so I am, I am very, very hopeful. And to your point about music, you know, we have the new Total Tech Solution stage. We have Rhythm on the Rails. We have a lot of music-oriented events. We do have bluegrass and, and music like that, that that gets played here. And so, you know, I do also see music as a great uh, gateway to get people to come and, and uh, visit Discovery Park and experience everything that we have here. Before we go, I want to also ask you what it was like to be on the set of The Last of the Mohicans. That's one of my favorite movies. Did you get to meet Daniel Day-Lewis? You know, um, I could have. We had to sign a waiver before we went out there. That, And I, I'd be happy to show you that paperwork if you want to see it. Well, I think I sent you a magazine article on it. I did, right? And it yeah. something like that. Yeah, and they wanted, us, they wanted us grunts to kind of stay away from the, the important people. And so I did that. But I know plenty of people who went up and you know, put the arm around him and got the picture, and he was just gracious about that. Um, there was several times I got to be a um, – elevated in status from being a, a mere grunt which that was fine i was glad to be out there to being a uh, a body extra for pete postawite he was the guy that plays sergeant major uh, jeffrey beams he arrests hawkeye you sir stand clear and he arrests hawkeye they shackle him up and so at least for about a week or so when i was uh sergeant major jeffrey beams stand-in um we went from eating cocoa puffs and really bad bologna to, and, and, uh, to eating like lobster and, and salad and, uh, really nice stuff. And so every day at lunch from the buffet, I sat right across the table from, from West Studi, uh, which yeah, it's really an interesting experience to watch Magua knocking down, uh, brownies and, uh, <laughs> you know, then going back out an hour later and clubbing somebody at the head. And, uh, you know, Daniel Day-Lewis and Madeline Stowe, um, it, it was a surreal experience. Uh, I remember one night up on the set where you were um, inside the fort, and it was a scale reproduction of Fort William Henry that uh, that was attacked in 1757. So, I mean, there again, that really would influence your writing, but that's another story. But we're, it was raining, so we're all just kind of crammed into the fort, all the extras and everybody, all the important people were all in there. And um, and something had happened. I won't get into the particulars. I'll, I'll tell you later. And uh, Madeline Stowe was, uh, you know, she, the, the, the beautiful Cora. And uh, she, sh she shrieked and she ran out the fort. 
and the, the rain had sort of subsided and I was out there and the little fog was moving in. And so you had this great backdrop. It was lit with these big light diffusers of Fort William Henry. It was just this great shot, not a soul out there, but you could see the smoke. And, and right in the middle, this woman shrieks and runs through the, uh, the fort gates and, uh, and a limo, stretch limo pulls out of the dark and she hops in and they take off and you go like, wow. They could abuse that, you know, like escaping in 1757. <laughs> yeah, that would have come in handy with those Abnakis after it was. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So, so you you really had these kind of like paradoxical moments where you would have that something going on historic, but it would be sort of just uh, utterly crashed by something that was modern. It was like Mel Gibson had sort of stepped in just, oh, I'm sorry, Mel Brooks, my ap apology. Mel Brooks had stepped in. There was one another time on set where the, 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 um, the indigenous people were on strike for uh, higher wages and uh, they got 75 bucks uh, uh, a day and um no a, a week uh plus i don't remember what the, the pay scale was my apologies on that but but whatever but we we all got we got 25 dollars less we lived in tents eating bad food they were in dorms they had the clocks uh cooks 24 hours a day around the clock but anyway sergeant major uh captain captain die was our training commander he wrote platoon he trained tom hanks and all those guys and he made us we were we were dressed as redcoats he made us fix bayonets and march through their picket line. So, <laughs> you know, you're just looking at this and, uh, you know, the Indians were all in their loincloths and everything, but they all had Walkmans on. That was back when you had a Walkman headset and they looked like big dragonflies because they'd have like Ray-Ban and Ballarama sunglasses with the, the roach, uh, with the roached hair and uh, and the Walkman. So we are, we're walking through with fixed bayonets. It's a, you can't make it up. I was in a, a, a mall in, in Ashland with a bunch of uh, native friends of mine that at Osage in Delaware and um, and Shawnees and they called security and <laughs> chased us out. I mean, we're just in there because it was air conditioning. But, you know, so uh, oh, that's great. What, yeah, what, I walked what up, you boys, you boys. I thought, yeah, I know. Immediately. <laughs> When you watch The Last of the Mohicans, do you see yourself in the movie? Family movie. We just sit there and laugh, and uh, I get killed about three or four different times. You're like, I die right here. Of course, like, you know, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's a hoot. And, you know, they, they don't do it now, but they used to have uh, about every three to five years, they would have a kind of an anniversary for all the grunts and the extras. We'd all go back out there where the set was and, and hoot and holler and, you know. That's kind of, you know, that, that's kind of died out now as the extras and grunts have kind of passed on as well. But uh, yeah, it, it's, have you done anything like that? I'm curious. No, ne never anything like that. I'm always behind the camera, never in front of it. Hey, listen, I cannot thank you enough for giving us your time today and sharing your stories with us. Uh, so interesting. Pleasure is mine. And I'm sorry, I, I'm probably a little bit in up here. I, I thought you wanted to talk on like heavy duty Boone and long hunters and all this stuff. So I'm like thinking, and I said, no, I think he wants to just talk about me. And so I, I hope I didn't overdo that lineup, but I don't want to be a modest. Oh no, not at all. All of our listeners I know were just as interested um, in hearing about you and the things you've been doing as, as I was. So thank, thank you so much. We, we really, really appreciate it. And I look forward to talking with you further about what we could do to bring history alive. Like you do here at discovery park of America. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And thank you to all you listeners who've joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. <laughs>